and they're talking about if they wonder if, if there's baseball in heaven. And Rick says to, to Jim, he says, boy, that'd be terrific if it was. Well, Jim dies a couple weeks later. Now Rick's without him. They used to sit in the park and have coffee and all that. And Rick's sitting there one day and he goes into the coffee shop and this <coughs> machine that had records starts to light up and everything. And it's Jim. He came back to tell him some news. Hey, Rick, how you doing? Hey, I miss you. And, you know, they're talking. And Jim says, I got good news and bad news for you, Rick. He said, the good news is there is baseball in heaven. Wow. That is terrific. What's the bad news? You're scheduled to pitch Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is the kind of group that I like. Bar, go to the bar, eat a chicken leg, get a little gravy on your shirt, which I did. <laughs> and nobody cares. If you had a suit on, he said, oh, look, you're all... I can go home, the wife will wash my sweater, that's all. <laughs> but um, questions from the audience? <coughs> Anything about baseball or sports or whatever? Yes, sir. Favorite player you ever got a chance to watch from behind home plate? Name a player what? Favorite. Best player you ever saw from behind home plate. The best player? Yeah. I'll, first I'll go to hitters. Clemente, Aaron, and Rose. Those are three of the best hitters I've ever seen. And there's many others. Uh, the guy from San Diego, uh, Tony Gwynn. Tony Gwynn. I mean, a magician with the bat. But uh, as far as pitchers, I could name you ten. I had, I had a lot of no hitters. I umpired a lot of no hitters. Um, you know, I got to tell you about a no hitter that I, a perfect game I almost had. I had a lot of perfect games, but this was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Chicago my second year, Cubs game. Lil Pappas is pitching. I'm behind the plate, my second year in baseball. And uh, we get to the seventh or eighth inning. Now, I, I, you know, the fans, are, there's 6,000 people at Wrigley Field. That's how good they were doing in 1972. Now they got 6,000 ushers. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing a little better. And uh, we get to the eighth inning, and I see the board. There's, he's got a no-hitter going, and people are buzzing. He's got a no-hitter going. We get to the ninth inning. He gets two outs. Pappas is still pitching. Per he's one out from a perfect game. I did not know that it would be a perfect game. I have to tell you that. Anybody ask me, I, I didn't know that he didn't have a guy on base at any time. I, you don't keep track of that. But he, to that point, he was perfect. He gets two strikes on a pinch hitter by the name of Larry Stahl. And he threw a ball. Hundley's his catcher, not a friendly guy. <laughs> Falls off the plate, ball one, one and two. Foul ball, then another pitch off the plate, two and two. On three and two, Pappas comes off the mound when I called it a ball. And he's coming. And I said to Hundley, if he gets here, tell him to just keep walking. <laughs> he's done. So Hundley gets him back on the mound. Whitey Lockman was the manager. And they get him back on the mound. Throws the next pitch and it's ball four. And he's fit to be tied, but now he's still got the no-hitter. Next batter makes out, and he ends up with a no-hitter. Jack Brickhouse, who was the, man, uh, the Cub announcer at the time, <clears throat> asked me the next day if I would do an interview with him. I said, sure. So Jack came in. And he said, you could have become famous, Bruce. At that time, you'd, I, I'd have been the 12th umpire in the history of baseball to have a perfect game. 
be involved in a perfect game. <laughs> and Breckhoff said to me, he said, you'd have been the 12th umpire. He said, you could have become famous. I asked him who the 11th umpire was. Of course he didn't know. <laughs> he said, that's how damn famous I'd have been. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. You mentioned Whitey Herzog, you got along with him pretty well. What manager did you not get along with very well? Did you say, did he say he didn't get along with Whitey Herzog? No. What manager did you, did you not get along with? Or didn't you? The rest of them. <laughs> I got along with everybody <laughs> until they got fresh. When they got fresh, you got the bouncer here. You see this? <laughs> it's hard to hear. I'm going to help you. Hard to hear. Hear this. Go back to your seat. <laughs> I'm just the, uh, that's a little rude to send a guy up and, uh, you know, with the broom and everything and uh, tell you to leave. I'm having fun with you. <laughs> no, a couple more questions and I'll be gone. No, no, I'm just here to help you hear them. You can't help me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. My question is this. If this is a baseball banquet, why are we doing the wave? Why are we doing what? Why are we doing the wave? The wave. Well, wave all you want. Just <laughs> stand up and wave. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna do something that she can talk about forever. Please stand up. In the count of three, we're gonna do three waves. One, two, three. One, two. Three. Sit your ass down. <laughs> you know what? That that's that is funny. <laughs> I never did the wave at a banquet before. And you, <laughs> you did terrific, and you look good doing it too. I think. <laughs> Anybody else? Right here. Yes, sir. Uh, were there any pitchers like Nolan Ryan, Bob Gibson, that just he kind of feared a little bit with yeah, what? the stuff that they had, as hard as they threw, and the movement that they had? Was there any pitcher that a little bit nervous when you were behind the plate? You know what? Any, I'm, I'm telling you the truth, though. We can tease a lot. Anybody that threw strikes, I loved. Yeah. And Ryan and Gibson, Gibson was, Bob Gibson was the greatest competitor and, and one of the best pitchers I ever had. Bob Gibson, could he could pitch, and so could Seaver, and so could Carlton, and a whole bunch of others. But when you got a guy like Seaver and Rick Rochelle of the Cubs and that, and they were in the strike zone, well, they make umpiring fun because they're throwing strike after strike, and they make you swing the bat. And uh, the guys that kill you, uh, one guy that was he was a relief pitcher, Stanhouse was his name. But he'd drive you nuts. You you, know, you got a drink before the game. <laughs> I mean, he'd be on the mound and, and rubbing the ball, and rubbing this and rubbing that, and, and uh, please throw the pitch. And one night we were in Montreal. Gene Mock was the manager, and this guy really was a pain in the ass on the mound because he wouldn't throw the ball. <laughs> and I'm behind Gary Carter, the catcher, in Montreal. And you know you're 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 almost like I mean throw the ball. <laughs> Finally, I just said throw the so and so ball. Carter gets out of his crouch. He says, Bruce, you're gonna you're gonna have a heart attack. I said I can't stand it anymore. And here comes Dick Williams, the manager, out of the Montreal dugout. He's upset, I think, because of what I said to his pitcher. And Williams comes out. Long as I live, I'll never forget it. And I think he's going to really chew me out. <clears throat> Bro, Fro, he called me. Fro, what's what's up? I said, I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> he said, how'd you like to look at it every night? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? 